This is the Jeff Santos Show. It is the Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. Coming to you live from the South Coast here in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We're going to be speaking to Mark Taylor Canfield in the coming minutes here. Folks, uh, as I said, we'll talk to Patrick Claiborne. I really want to spend uh, some time over over the coming days sort of analyzing where the national media is playing on the infrastructure bill. They really don't want to see the Bernie uh, Biden one. And uh, they are already saying, oh, no, it's not going to happen. It's going to be very difficult. I saw MSNBC that they say this, CNN, similarly. And, and this is something that we're going to follow. Um, we're going to try to bring on a few more members of the media to take a look at this, including our, our great panels of people like John Nichols and Joe Williams and, and others, uh, including Bob Kuzak of The Hill we're going to have on next week. But this is, to me, important because we need to get, you know, media folks. We also need to, you know, figure out how these athletes, that's why we're having Patrick Claibon of the NFL Network on, the great African-American uh, journalist who does more than just cover, you know, the NFL X's and O's, was very much involved in the whole Floyd case. So we'll look forward to that next week as well. But we look forward right now to our great friend from the 206. He is, of course, a great journalist and investigative journalist, Democracy Watch News. Check him out there. He's a great musician. If you're in Seattle, you're going to see him playing in the uh, show box and many other places in the coming weeks as they open up. And of course, you hear him here every Friday here on the Jeff Santos Show at 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific. And then, of course, it's time to go to the 206 and say hello to Mark Taylor Canfield. MTC, how you doing, my man? Welcome back, Jeff. Back in black, yeah. man. It is uh, so cool to hear you, my friend. Uh, look, we got ourselves a situation here where there is, is so much going on in the world of politics. I need a little break. I think that the break really doesn't go very far in the next field. And then a question I have for you, which I think is right up your alley. I, I, I came across accidentally on this um, on this TV video about the Washington, D.C. scenario of punk rock and how they took over that decade uh, in the nation's capital. They were showing Marion Barry and Reagan and everybody else there in the 70s and, and uh, early 80s. And it was a huge uh, effect, uh, of course, in Seattle, in New York with the Ramones. And San Francisco uh, had their scene. And I, I think... You know, as as somebody who's a musician and is obviously politically uh, motivated, I mean, this is a, a genre of music. Not that you know that uh, that Jimi Hendrix and uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash and others were not. And of course, Nirvana and Pearl Jam have their own political stuff too. But you know, the punk rock movement was just that, and it was in your face, which we need right now in in Washington D.C. because we have too many people who are running scared uh, on the Democratic side of the Republicans, and this, this to me is something that I think we need to explore. And we're going to spend the entire segment on this. But I wanted to get your thoughts because to me, this is exactly where the passion, you know, we need to go to 11, as they said in Spinal Tap. And punk rock did just that from the Sex Pistols on. Your thoughts, my friend. My amp does go to 11, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. It does. It has a sticker that says 11 on it. Uh, well, you know, I, as I was saying in my, my tweet, or my actually my text message earlier to you, uh, there are bands in Seattle that have been heavily influenced by the punk rock scene. And, you know, we can, we can talk about the, the opening of the clubs and what's going on here right now, but traditionally um, the punk rock scene had a big influence on the grunge movement because that was sort of a post-punk uh, movement, but it was very much influenced by the ethic and the attitude of the punk rock movement. And we currently have two very amazing bands in Seattle, both fronted by amazingly talented and outspoken black women. That's uh, Eva Walker with the Black Tones, her and her brother, her twin brother, Cedric, who's on drums, and then um, Shana Shepard with Bear Axe, who's the, one of the best singers I've ever heard, a very talented um, performer. And they both claim that their bands, and and I consider them the two best bands out of Seattle right now, ready for the big time. I think they're both great uh, bands. However, they, of course,
course, would play themselves then because that's part of the Seattle ethic, and it goes back to the punk rock movement where it's kind of an anti-rock star kind of attitude. I mean, you know, when Nirvana was wearing the boots and the and the flannel shirts, the plaid shirts or whatever on MTV, that was really who they were. They came from a logging town, Aberdeen, Hope Williams, kind of a twin city along the coast of Washington where it rains a lot, and, you know, everybody was in the logging industry back in those days. Now that industry is just has is not happening at all. But all of these bands, the Melvins also are attributed to some great influences on bands in Seattle. Oh, everybody loves the Melvins in Seattle. I got to hang out with Buzz Osborne, the crazy eccentric lead singer with the crazy hair, um, and they're still out there rocking. Um, all of these bands claim their heritage from punk rock somewhere along the way. I know that. Sometimes Eva Walker likes to call the Black Tones punk blues because her album is called Cornbread and Cobain because they grew up originally as young folks in the South, but then they moved to Seattle and were really turned on by the grunge rock movement. So there's this mixture in their music and in my music and also in, in their acts where they, there's a mixture of all these styles, but it definitely has been influenced a lot by the punk attitude, which is about just trying to be honest and authentic in, in the music you make and not trying to go the the L.A. style glam, you know, super hype kind of stuff. Um, it's, you know, it's part of the ethic here to kind of play that down and to try to be authentic. By the way, the Black Pines do have a very political song about George Floyd and unfortunately other black young men and women who have been killed in this country by police. And it's just right in your face in terms of politics. I mean, and they are all of the members of the band are African American and they definitely support the Black Lives Matter movement. And even though, you know, most of the time when we play music, it's just, it's about the music. That at times, you know, you have no choice as a as a person of color at all in this country. You, you have no choice but to be political at times because, you know, people's lives are on the line. So there you go. Very political song from them. You know, very outspoken members of the community who are willing to, to go the extra effort to get these messages out about justice in our own community and across the, the planet. So... The punk rock movement has influenced people in terms of the authenticity and need for just being who you are, kind of, you know, DIY, do it yourself, be yourself. You know, because part of the punk ethic was, hey, anybody can be in a band, so just learn how to play a guitar and don't try to make it pretty. And I, you know, find that I'm, some of my songs are a little punky, even though I do mix the blues and the funk and the rock and stuff in there too. But I certainly really appreciate these days, especially just the sound of, sound of a loud guitar, <laughs> a loud distorted guitar and drums. It just seems to me like that's the, the iconic rock sound, whether it's the 60s garage rock bands like the Sonics, not, not the basketball team, but the band from Tacoma that influenced a lot of people. There were a lot of garage bands in the 60s, too, who had a very raw sound, and they had a big influence on the punk scene as well. I remember... As a kid, I liked punk music, and although it was before my time as a musician, I was like, okay, I like this stuff. And then all of a sudden, I realized that punk will never go away, that people are always going to love these bands. And I got to hang out with DOA, the uh, iconic punk band from Vancouver, um, who did this amazing show up there in uh, the East Kootenays, uh, in the mountains up there. But... Punk rock has had a big influence on me and a lot of other people, and I'm sure it will continue that. And then there's the political side, which is something that I think more and more musicians need to incorporate into their music. I mean, you can't really be a musician these days without being political to some degree as well, because you know what's happening in the country and what's happening to the, the people in your audience, and you feel an obligation to speak out against injustice and and for some more forward-thinking values and um, ideas that might help shape our country in the future, you know, rather than... There was a time in the U.K., and I remember talking to people uh, years ago, and I did a, uh, I did a demo, actually, on, on, on the whole issue of um, 
the Sex Pistols and the Clash, you know, coming from London and so forth. And, and uh, you know, the real movement there, you know, that ended tragically at the Chelsea Hotel in New York with, with Sid Vicious and his, uh, and his girlfriend there. I, I, I look at that time period, you know, I was, I was very young, but I look at that time period and I think, you know, so much was built there you know, in terms of the anger of the population. I mean, you know, you were going through very difficult times in London that brought you Margaret Thatcher.